Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so as promised, we're going to have a review screencast. Um, so uh, this this screencast is going to focus on World War One alone. Uh, now, unlike other past screencasts, there's really no pictures that kind of go along with it. It's just review. So it's going to be a straight lecture, um, just reviewing uh, basic things. The only thing that's going to change is kind of the top bar. I was just going to tell you kind of the the topic that we're gonna we're gonna take a look at. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, causes of World War One. Then we're gonna kind of jump all the way through um, the different aspects of World War One. So when we say causes of the war, we're really looking at causes for the United States. And so the big idea here that you have to pay attention to is the idea of being a neutral country and declaring neutrality when uh, the war breaks out. So our president at the time, President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and really the whole country is kind of behind this idea of neutrality. Now, the question that you want to ask yourself is, was the United States a neutral country? Um, and kind of like, what was our dynamics? What was our, our, our relationship with the, you know, with the powers that, the belligerent nations that are involved in World War I? And so, uh, really, a, we're a neutral country, but what that means is that uh, we don't actually fight in the war, but we do trade, or we try to trade often with both sides in the conflict. And so, really what ultimately happens here, the British are going to blockade the North Sea, and the Germans are going to use a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. And so, because of this, uh, we don't really have true freedom of the seas. Uh, so we're trading, but we're trading primarily with the British, and they become our major trading partner. And we are trading armament um, and munitions for the war, uh, because you know, it's facilitating growth in the United States economy. And so we're trading these things back and forth with the British. Now, within Wilson's government, you're having disagreements about the situation. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, he really uh, favors the British, ultimately, and he sees them as our, as our real ally uh, in the war. His Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, uh, he's going to say that you know since America really can't trade with the Germans because of the blockade of the North Sea, uh, he's basically going to say that the U.S. should stop trading with everyone. So that's his idea of neutrality. And by you know, trading with one side, you're really ultimately favoring uh, one side in the conflict. Now, the actual events that are going to pull us into the war um, really have to do with Germany's policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. So the first big event uh, is the sinking of the Lusitania, which is a British passenger liner that's leaving from New York City going to England. Now, most of the people on board are British, but there are American citizens on board. Now, the Germans had warned people and warned uh, neutral nations not to allow their uh, citizens to travel on to any kind of uh, British ship um, because they suspected that the British were transporting munitions and uh, uh, products for the war um, secretly in their cargo of passenger ships. So what happens in 1915 is the Lusitania is sunk and uh, Wilson kind of deals with the Germans very sternly unlike the way that he, he dealt with the British when they blockaded the North Sea. Um, he basically uh, forces, I don't say forces them, but really kind of puts pressure on them um, to issue something called the Sussex Pledge. And the Sussex pledge uh, pledged that the Germans would not practice uh, unrestricted submarine warfare anymore. Um, that they recognized that it violated um, the laws of neutrality, and they wouldn't um, sink passenger ships, you know, during the conflict. Uh, now, as the war goes on, the Germans are struggling. They're not being able to get enough food into their country, and so they kind of eventually are going to resume this policy of unrestricted submarine warfare and start sinking not only British ships, but also American ships. So eventually they sink three American ships. And this is going to kind of facilitate and kind of grow public opinion. Because the other thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, public opinion in the United States is dead set against the war. Um, a lot of Americans uh, kind of believe as far as European conflicts, we should be isolationists. We should not um, get involved politically at all. Kind of. Uh, reiterating uh, George Washington's uh, farewell address and his ideas about getting involvement, getting involved in European conflicts. And so it takes a lot for the American public to kind of be pushed into the direction of joining the war. 
Uh, now, one other event we didn't talk about in class, but kind of adds to the fuel to join on the Allied side, fighting against Germany and Austria and the Ottoman Empire, um, is Germany sends a telegram called the Zimmerman Telegram to, uh, to Mexico. And basically what this said was, it was intercepted by the British, but what it said, uh, it basically asked Mexico to join the war to attack the United States. And this is before we're in the war. Um, and in return, if, they, if the Central Powers win the war, um, what Germany was going to do is return to them all the territories that they had gained or that the United States had gained from Mexico in the Mexican-American War. So our entire Southwest, like Texas, New Mexico, Nevada, California. Um, now, Mexico rejects the, the Zimmerman telegram, but the British intercepted, tell the Americans, the American public hears about it, and so it just kind of kind of fuels the idea that we should join on the Allied power side. All right, so the next big thing is once we do join and we join on the Allied power side, um, things are going to change a little bit within the country. So during a wartime, the government takes an expanded role. And remember, this has happened before in American history. During the Civil War it happened. It's going to happen in World War I and World War II. I'm an expansion of wartime powers, um, especially in World War I, because World War I is really um, our first totally industrialized war. The Civil War is an industrialized war in certain ways, um, but World War I is kind of like a full-out um, production-based war. So producing things for the country becomes very important. And so uh, there's two kind of different ways that we're trying to, or a couple different ways we're trying to fuel uh, the American public to support the war. So the first one is we're kind of creating all this propaganda. And this guy George Creel is in charge of uh, the propaganda machine um, to kind of gain popular support and get people to back the war cause and to do their part to help America win. And then um, this guy Bernard Baruch is going to be put in charge of kind of reformatting uh, businesses for, uh, for the war effort. And so you have different people who are in charge of uh, different industries. Now, as far as what changes, uh, the federal government takes a much more active role in what used to be private business. And so private businesses, um, they're going to basically set up like these contracts with these private businesses to try and get them to produce uh, as much for the war as they physically possibly can. Um, and so they're going to limit what these companies can produce. So uh, maybe styles, they're going to limit how much what they can produce. Um, try and get them to limit, um, you know, colors, um, different aspects of it. Um, and it's all going to be kind of dictated by the federal government. Uh, the other thing that's going to happen here is that the federal government is going to take charge of uh, the railroad system within the United States, uh, just so they can control freight shipping. Um, so you have much expanded powers uh, from the federal government. And some of the other ex extended powers really is going to tie into people who are... Um, protesting against the war. So they passed these uh, different acts called, uh, you know, the Sedition Acts, or the Espionage and Sedition Acts uh, during World War I. And these are really aimed at stopping uh, people who want to speak out against the war and also to find potential spies because there's, ner there's nervousness about the German, our large German population and whether they can be fully trusted or would ger can German spies actually infiltrate um, our community and you know, disrupt or, you know, gain intelligence about the United States. Uh, so they passed these acts. Um, the Sedition Act is aimed to stop speaking out against the war, writing against the war. Uh, and so this is challenged a couple of times. Um, but the famous one that's going to, how it's going to be challenged um, is in this famous Supreme Court case, Shank versus the United States. And so in Shank versus the United States, uh, we talked about it in class, um, what Shank is going to have a, uh, an issue with is going to be this uh, the Selective Service Act, which is the draft that starts to take place um, in 1917 when we officially enter. Uh, and he kind of attributes it or compares it to slavery um, and being forced into um, servitude and doing something that's against your will. Now, he also has elements of socialism uh, within him. So part of this wartime uh, dissent um, is coming from like a socialist aspect and this feeds into uh, the Red Scare that takes place after the war and like the Palmer Raids. Um, so like there's a distrust of immigrants, there's a distrust of socialist, communist ideology, anarchists, 
um, around World War One, and that feeds into the Red Scare and like that hysteria that happens after the war. So Shank is a good example of that. It's during the war, but it's kind of like something that's going to also feed into stuff after the war. Um, so Shank he sues the federal government uh, because what happens is that he sends out pamphlets to tell people to burn their draft cards, and they arrest him, um, put him in jail uh, for breaking the you know sedition and uh, espionage act. And eventually his case gets all the way to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court rules is that um, they rule in favor of the federal government, saying that uh, using the, the clear and present danger test, by Shank sending out his pamphlets, um, they say that he could have potentially caused uh, riots, he could have potentially caused chaos within the country, and dis not just disrupted the war effort, but um, disrupted the, uh, the peace of the country. And so the example that they use is you can't scream fire in a crowded movie theater if, if there's not a fire uh, because it could cause chaos and it's a limit on your freedom of speech. So they kind of said the same thing. It's a limit on your freedom of speech. So you often see this during wartime where um, people's rights that they take for granted are, are limited. Um, so during the Civil War, Lincoln does it in several ways, but the most famous one is the, the suspension of the right of habeas corpus. Um, and so it's not the first time it's been done but um, it kind of creates an, an uproar. And in World War II, this kind of theme is going to come back about limiting certain groups' rights. Um, we're going to get to the point of relocating certain ethnic groups because of distrust during the war. Um, and so you see this um, very fervent patriotism during these, uh, these total wars. And you know, because you need the civilian population totally behind you to be successful. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about um, is the Treaty of Versailles. So, to the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, we send our, our President Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson comes with his own ideas. He comes with his 14 points, which is his idea for peace in the world, um, prepared to the Peace Conference. Now, for the most part, they don't really take a lot of Woodrow Wilson's ideas. They take bits and pieces of it and apply it mostly to uh, the losers in the conflict. But they don't really take his ideas full on out. Now, the idea that they do take from him is going to be the League of Nations. Um, and so they signed the, the Treaty of Versailles. And from your global history, you should know that the Treaty of Versailles um, is very one-sided, punish Ger punishes Germany very strongly because the other allies view Germany as the reason that uh, we fought the war. Now, when the treaty comes back to the United States, how this works, just because Woodrow Wilson approved the treaty, it doesn't mean that the United States has approved the treaty. What they have to do, or how our government works, is treaties have to be approved by the Senate, by the U.S. Senate. So Woodrow Wilson comes back with the Treaty of Versailles. Um, now you have different groups in the United States who are going to oppose the Treaty of Versailles for different reasons. You have the two big groups are the Reservationists and the Irreconcilables. So the Reservationists, both of them, two things you want to understand. So you have the, the Reservationists and the Irreconcilables. Um, those are the names of the groups of people who are against it. But there's also, those differences fall along political party lines. So you have Wilson, who's a Democrat. The Democrats, for the most part, support the treaty. So it becomes a political party issue. Both the reservationists and the irreconcilables are Republican. Um, but they oppose the treaty for different reasons. And it doesn't mean that they might not necessarily pass the treaty ultimately. So the reservationists disprove of the treaty because they feel like there's certain things in the treaty that need to be tweaked a little bit, fixed a little bit. Um, ultimately, they're not totally against the Treaty of Versailles. The irreconcilables, on the other hand, feel like the treaty is so bad that they can't fix it at all. And so the irreconcilables um, kind of try and start to uh, stir public opinion and try and stir their fellow senators to vote against the treaty. Now, a couple of different dynamics kind of play into this. Um, Woodrow Wilson, um, really is kind of unbending in the treaty and he's unwilling to try and compromise and change the treaty. Um, and what happens here is he, he ends up getting so frustrated become, because it becomes a partisan issue um, that he really ultimately doesn't try and work with the different sides and ultimately the Democrats end up voting against the treaty too because Wilson tells them to vote against the treaty instead of voting in favor of the treaty. And so the big issues that the irreconcilables and the reservationists have with the treaty 
some of them are upset about the way it punishes Germany, uh, but there is, you know, quite a bit of resistance to the League of Nations. All right, we're out of time, so hopefully this was helpful.